Welcome into the Five on the Floor podcast on the Five Reasons Sports Network. Make sure to check out fivereasonsports.com. Spell it out, F-I-V-E, reasonsports.com. The only all-free website in South Florida where you get our podcasts, but also our latest columns and articles on all the South Florida sports teams, our YouTube channel, and our merchandise, our Miami Heat merchandise, but also our Miami Dolphins to a merchandise, which is the hottest stuff in the store right now. So check all of that out. And of course, our latest episodes of Three Yards Per Carry, Five Rings Canes on the Miami Hurricanes, and more. Today's special episode is brought to you in part by Greenview Construction, specifically a division of Greenview Construction called Making America Clean Again. That's M-A-C-A-I-N-C dot net, Maca inc.net you can find them at 855-561-6653 and of all of our sponsors we love all of our sponsors but none of them is more appropriate than this one for today's times why because people want to know the place they're going into especially if it's a business is clean and safe and that's what they do for you you've got to get that certificate for either bacterial viral fungi mold get all of those cleaning treatments and get that up on your window so people know it is safe to go inside and properly cleaned by a licensed professional. They professionally clean, sanitize, disinfect, and sterilize. They offer those services to a wide range of residential and commercial properties. So you got to check it out. MacaInc.net. That's M-A-C-A-I-N-C.net. Making America Clean Again. 855-561-6653. And now, today's episode. Welcome to Five on the Floor, a Miami Heat and NBA podcast from Ethan Skolnick with Alvon Sydney, a.k.a. ALF954, brought to you by the Five Reasons Sports Network. All right, back here on Five on the Floor, I've got Alex Toledo, but I've also got a special guest. You can check out the rest of these episodes in our library. We did one with Chris Bosch, recently with Shane Battier, Mario Chalmers did a couple of these with Udonis Haslam. Grant Long um, is also in our library, Brian Grant. And now we've got an opportunity to speak to one of, I think this qualifies as one of the heat lifers, right, Alex? I think this Oh, no doubt. Uh, he, he's in that category? No doubt. I mean, the guy's been playing on the Heat since before I was born. I've been seeing him as an assistant coach for the team for as long as I can remember. No doubt. All right. So, and yeah, well, we'll get to your age here in a second, Alex. But uh, before, <laughs> because we, before you were born, it wasn't that long ago. But all right, let's let, let's get right. it. Uh, the great Keith Askins uh, is with us. Obviously, he's now very heavily involved in scouting with the Miami Heat. But as Alex mentioned, he joined the Heat as an undrafted free agent. Uh, in 1990, uh, and then was with the Heat through 99, and then uh, joined the bench, moved to the scouting department. Um, let, let's start here, Keith, with, with that story of how you – because this is pre-Riley, and we're going to talk about some mm -hmm. of that transition when that happened in the middle of that decade. But the story of you finding your way to the Heat uh, after playing in Alabama. <laughs> well, you know, I um... – you know, after the draft, I was actually, I didn't even watch the draft my, uh, my senior year. I was studying for a final with a friend. And after the draft, uh, Wimp calls me in his office and says, um, there's an agent that thinks you may be able to play professional basketball. And um, he wants to send you down to Miami. And I'm like, wow. I said, yeah, I didn't know Miami even had a team. I didn't watch a lot of professional basketball. And um, I said, you know, sure. Why not? The coach, you know, coach Sanderson told me, you know, look, if it doesn't work out, you know, you can always come back here and we'll, you know, things you're in a good place. Uh, I was about to graduate, uh, from college. So my degree was in line. I was ready to get that. So I, basketball was, has always been a game to me and it was, and it was always fun. So I, you know, I came down to, uh, to a rookie, to a rookie camp, um, and <laughs> we played in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And, uh, that's where I, you know, I played against Bimbo in, in college and, uh, we had had a, you know, I'd seen him in a couple maybe in Chicago when I went there and, and to, to end up playing with him was, and have someone with my same personality was, was awesome. Um, so, 
you know, Stu Inman, uh, Billy Cunningham, Louis Chaffel, and most importantly, Coach Ron Rothstein uh, saw something in me early and invited me back uh, to, to vet camp. And you want to jump in? Yeah, well, no, my question on this, well, first thing, before we, we go on, and we'll get to vet camp, when you're dropping names here, for those who are a little bit younger, when you just say mm-hmm. Wimp and Bimbo, everybody's like, okay, well, <laughs> Wimp Sanderson was, Wimp, Wimp was Sanderson. your college coach right. at Alabama. Was my college coach at Alabama. Uh, you know, he's an Alabama lifer. I, mm-hmm. you know, and, and we're still, you know, I still consider him, you know, uh, an important figure in my life to this day. Um, Bimbo Coles uh, was drafted, I think, by Sacramento, was mm-hmm. traded. Uh, the Heat traded Rory for him. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and we had a really cool class. My, my rookie class was, was rather impressive when you think about Willie Burden, uh, Alex Kessler, may he rest in peace. Alan Ogg, may he rest in peace. Uh, you know, it, it was a good hard group. Of, I call it an eclectic group of rookies. <laughs> <laughs> and, and again, this was the third year of the franchise. This is 1990. Right. Uh, right. So after, after the first two years, so Ronnie had got his feet wet a little bit. All right. So, so go to, uh, go to veteran camp with this group and and did you sort of immediately see that your role was going to be maybe defensive specialist or how that was going to evolve well well that's that's that was just my game i think i'd won uh, three defensive awards uh you know after my my sophomore junior senior year at alabama i won a defensive award every year that was just what i enjoyed doing uh you know when i was growing up my favorite player to watch was michael cooper uh so I just enjoyed guarding people, and and that's what I did when I came here. I remember Wimp told me because I was never a ball handler growing up through high school, uh, college. I always played in in a system in which the point guard uh, handled the ball. It was like uh, basically a one four offense, and being that you know I was fairly athletic, we were I was able to rebound, pass it, get it to the guard, and run. And that's what, and that's what I did. And so, my goal, <laughs> and when I came here, Wimp told me, he said, he said, Keith, this is how you're gonna make it. He said, do what you do well, and don't try to do what you can't do. And I said, okay. <laughs> so I came down with a defensive personality and and a disposition, uh, and and it it helped me. I you know I considered myself to be low maintenance at the time. Um, you know, when I came, I, I had no idea what I was getting into. I mean, I came down here for veteran camp. I borrowed $500 and came with my college footlocker. And, <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and 30 years now, I'm still here, thank God. Uh, so, you know, it's, you know, it's a testament to, to hard work. And, you know, as we were talking about earlier, when, you, when you're coming in on a non-guaranteed and you're just trying to make it, you got to you got to be in the mindset of living one day at a time uh, because that's basically what it is. You don't know when that phone call is going to ring and they're going to tell you come into the office and bring your playbook. Keith, I wanted to ask, this is actually a good jumping point because now we can compare guys like Kendrick Nunn, Dr. Robinson, who went and drafted mm-hmm. to you, the original right. uh, drafted Miami Heat OG. Uh, what are the you know what are the similarities and differences you see between the way that they approach the game and the way that they got to where they are now, going from undrafted to you know essential part of the success? Yeah. Well, you know what what it shows you, and you you got to say that these that these kids that are making it by the unconventional rule of coming in non drafted, and there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, sometimes you're you know. It's about being in the right place and the right time, and and having a group of coaches and and front office uh, execs to believe in you and give you an opportunity and a platform to succeed. Now, the platform is there, but you got to be willing to do it, and that's that's doing it every day. Um, you know, you got to have confidence in yourself. Um, you got to believe it and really believe that you're, you're, you belong. Um, 
and take it one day at a time because every day you step out on that court as a undrafted player, you want to, you know, you, you have to perform. Now you're not going to perform well all the time, but you can perform smartly. I mean, you know, the last thing you want to do as a, as the last thing you want to be as a player trying to make it is high maintenance. So you got to have a sense of durability where you can play through injury and you got to be willing to be the first one there and the last one to leave. And if the coach tells you to jump, you just start jumping and don't ask how long and how high you just do it. So let's take you back to that veteran camp then, because Mm -hmm. so you're in there, it's year three. I mean, the heat at that point had already drafted, you know, pretty high. I mean, they had psych, they had, they had Ronnie, uh, they had Kevin Edwards. who I think a lot of people forget about, you know, they, they obviously they added Sherm um, and so long Grant long, who also, I mean, unconventional route and then, and Glenn, um, right. and so, so you come in there and then Willie Burton was, you know, I mean, right. and the diff- the difference then I think was everybody knew the college players cause they saw right. the college players play for four mm-hmm. years. So mm-hmm. everybody knew Willie Burton in Minnesota. Everybody right. knew Glenn Rice at Michigan. Everybody knew Ronnie and, and Sherman in Syracuse. Right. How good did you think that core could be? And then kind of go into the transition a little bit, obviously, eventually there was the change from Ronnie to Kevin, but right. how good did you think that that core could be at that time? Yeah, you know, it, it was an athletic core and it was a group that we really got along well together. But, you know, in the NBA, youth doesn't, youth is not going to win a lot of basketball games because you got to be able to, to know it's coming. And the only way you know it's coming is by seeing it over and over and playing against it. And I mean, when you're talking about, you know, rookies going against Isaiah Thomas, Joe Dumars, and, and players of that caliber, you know, they, they know every trick of the trade. I mean, they, you know, you know, as a rookie, you don't know if the ball is dribbling down on the right side and you got a five-man trail and you got a three-man in the corner, a two-man in a slot, and a four-man on the, on the low weak side block. You don't know that that's going to be a one-five pick and roll until you've set yourself up, until you've seen it coming beforehand. I mean, so it's basically like you're a little kid starting in kindergarten, learning to read, <laughs> learning to read again. Mm-hmm. And um, that's, the, that's the biggest thing about being able to, to succeed at the NBA level is, is to have, have the IQ to, uh, to, to recognize uh, and, and then play against it. So, but really talented team. Glenn, one of the best, one of the best jump shooters I've ever seen. I mean, at his size and with uh, with his release point, I mean, it's almost impossible to block his shot. I mean, he was so confident, so fun. To, you know, he and I used to get it. I used to get at him every day. You know, we used to go at it every day. I love guarding Glenn, and uh, because he he made me better, and I and I'm for sure I made him better because I know when I get into if I can get into your head because I'm gonna play you the same way every time. It's going. It's going to make you better. I mean, we had some great. We had some some really intense practices, and it was a lot of fun. Well, but give us, well, of, give us, get, Keith, give us one. Give, give us like, like, t- tell me a time that you thought you got in Glenn's head a little bit. In uh, well, it's not that you know. I I never intend to get in his head. I just think I I, I really upset him because I yeah you know, I've always been a physical type player, and um, we we actually we had a, a push you know a push a push. We used to practice at the University of Miami. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was one of our practice spots, and you know we had, we had a little push. It wasn't anything major. After that, we were still able to to leave and go out and have a beer together. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah, but he should have bought though. He was you. Uh, you, 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 had know, to, you had to borrow five hundred dollars. He he was the fourth pick of the draft. That's a little let different. Me, let, let me tell you about my my teammates. My rookie year, man, those guys were so giving. Uh, at the time, we used to have a. Uh, uh, a promotion with Benny Hanna's. And so, you know, they, when they were doing radio interview, they, you know, they would get a, a certificate for a meal for two. And man, those guys were so nice. They, they actually would come by and just drop it to me and Bimbo almost every, after every interview, Bimbo and I had a, so Bimbo and I became regulars at Benny Hanna. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you were yeah. like their plus one and their plus two, oh, basically. Oh, <laughs> they, they, 
hey, man, Keith, take this. You can have it. Oh, thanks, man. So they took care of me, man. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, Kevin Edwards was such a was, – was, was so vital to my, to my growth off the court because, you know, he was the first one that, that introduced me to, uh, to, I say, fine dining where you go out, you know, have to wear a coat. You know, back then in the 90s, you know, the early 90s, Miami was, you know, I think there was the, the Miami Vice scene where everyone was still dressing in, you know, dress clothes, nice shoes, um, you know, slacks, jacket. So we did that quite a bit after games and, um, you know, got turned on to some really nice restaurants and, and learn how to eat and pair wine and, you know, and, and just, and just enjoy, you know, the other side of basketball. You know, I, I guess we say reaping the fruits of our labor. What was the feeling like when you were told you made the team? Man, I'll never forget it. Uh, one of the things that happened to me in my rookie year and, and preseason, we were playing up at FAU and they had a, a basketball court that was like a, it was almost like a rock. I think it was FIU. It was a really hard court. FAU, I'm sorry. It was a really hard court. And I go up for a rebound and I, I, I fractured my, my right heel. And so that put me out for like six weeks. Now at the time, Milt Wagner, he and I have been roommates since the summer because uh, he came over from the Lakers, I think, as a free agent. And um, we have been roommates all summer. So we're living at the – I think we're at the uh, the Hyatt downtown, yes. And phone rings. And it's an early morning call. Oh, you know, and he's like – I got the I got the call, man. And you know, I'm I'm clueless to the situation. So I, he said, "Yeah, I got the call." And he's like, "Yeah, man, I think the, they're gonna cut me today." And I'm like, "What?" He said, "Yeah, I think they're gonna they're gonna release me." And they released him and activated me. So I I, I actually lost a you know a roommate the day that I was activated to play. So it was kind of bittersweet because I you know, and what it showed me you know what I learned then is that. It's a it's a really cutthroat business, you know, because the only thing they're trying to do is win, and you got to beat out the guy next to you. And the guy next to me happened to be my roommate at the time. Coach, uh, I wanted to ask. There's been a lot of '90s nostalgia with the Last Dance. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of talk about the eras and the difference between how it was back then, how it is now, how the game has changed. I wanted to ask. You were there. You had to go up against Mike. You were there in the '90s playing. Are you of the of the camp that misses the '90s and says that that's a superior brand of basketball? How do you feel about that? No, no, I'm not going to say the '90s is a superior brand to the 2000s. I can't say that because uh, what I will say is that the '90s was definitely a more physical time than now. Um, mm -hmm. I think with the influx of the the European player, and um, I would probably say the size of the athlete uh, has changed the game uh, in the 2000s. Uh, now you'll see you 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 won't see <clears throat> a lineup where you'll go across the front line of say let's bring up we'll say the New York Knicks in the 90s when you played against. Um, Mark Jackson at the point, uh, Allen Houston at the two. Then you could put uh, I, uh, Latrell Sprewell at the three. Uh, then you go with Charles Oakley at the four, and you got Patrick Ewing at the five. And you want to go bigger, you can put Mace at the three. I mean, Think about the size that you want. There's very seldom where you'll see a lineup now where you can go in the front line, six ten, seven foot, seven foot across the board. Yeah, and let them and have one guy, you know, take his position on the block because now everyone is talking about space. I mean, the space, the court hasn't changed in years. The court is the same. They're, they're just taking people and moving around. So what you have now, you have seven footers that move like, uh, like guards that are, have become and have a skill set of guards that can play on a perimeter. Um, 
And so the game has, has allowed the space. And I remember when, you know, this thing of freedom of movement, when there's no hand, no hand checking, I mean, AI was small, and he would take a beating. And, and the reason why, you know, we gave him a nickname, Coach McAdoo and myself, we called him Pound for Pound. Because at the time, there was no one tougher pound for pound than Allen Iverson. I mean, he played every game. He attacked, he attacked you from the moment he stepped on the court to the final horn. Um, so, you know, they're, they're not the, – the physicality of the game has definitely changed. Uh, but – when you see the skill set of some of these younger guards now that, and they have the freedom where they can pull up at 30. You know, if you pull up at 30 in the nineties, man, you may not even play it anymore. You, you could, if, if you, <laughs> 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 no one's pulling up. I mean, that stuff of downtown Freddie Brown and that was in the eighties. Other than that, no, you're not pulling up from 30 feet. <laughs> you, know, you pull up from 30 you pull up for 30 on a quick shot and you coming out coach looking at you funny and and you know gm's trying to make a phone call to get you out of there yeah. uh, you don't do that <laughs> so, so keith what was the all right so you coming in 90 um at that point it was sort of after the pistons run transition to the bulls run mm-hmm. uh what was your first experience guarding mj Man, you know, I, I, I remember one instance where I wasn't guarding, but I was sitting there watching, man. It, we, um, we were playing a game, and, you know, we were actually hanging in there with him. But he was – I think he had only had, like, 15 points in the first half or something. And, you know, on a switch, man – he can just he just turned it on. I think he probably went for thirty five in the second. Pro, I think he probably finished with fifty for that game, and that was on a game where he didn't even want to play. And I'll never forget Coach Lockery telling the guys because you know we're still young. He said, "Hey, now what you learn today is you let sleeping dogs lie. If a, if the man does not want to play, don't start talking to him." Yeah, <laughs> you know, I just sat there and watched guys talk to him, and like, all right, you know, you see some guys start shaking his head. I mean, but to 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 uh, Michael Jordan's credit, one of the most fundamentally sound players that I've ever gone against, mm-hmm. and not only physically but mentally. I mean, he when he stepped down the court, man, yeah, and. It's kind of like he was using art of war tactics on, on on guys, you know, like he would come by and tap a guy on his ass and then all of a sudden he's going at him, he's trying to torch him. So, you know, and, and what he was doing is just taking, you know, letting the guy's guard down to him. Oh, oh, he likes me. <laughs> and then he, <laughs> then he comes out and tortures you. Yeah, he's paying me respect. Yeah, shoot. Yeah, right. He's just setting you up for the kill. Um, but left foot, Right foot forward, reverse, could finish with the left hand, could finish with the right. Uh, and it's funny, when you think about the way he scored, not until late in, t- in his career did he start taking the three, shooting the three ball. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're talking about arguably the best scorer in the game ever to play the game, lived in the mid range. Mm-hmm. Now that shot is considered a bad shot in analytics. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing, you know. Yeah, I was going to I was gonna ask you about that, and, and then I want to get to the transition to Pat coming in uh, mm-hmm. in the 90s. But, I mean, that has changed the game dramatically, and I almost feel, and we've talked about this a little on our podcast, Alex and I and Alf, I almost feel like the mid-range comes back into vogue because it's the one shot that's not, that defenses are not trying to take away right. as oh, much anymore because they're trying to face it. the playoffs. Well, right. Hey, once, once the playoffs start, I mean – yeah, once the playoffs start and everyone start keying on trying to take your three away, you got to be able to do something else. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, you'll you'll see, and you know how everyone talked about you know Golden State when they that they they had their run, how prolific they were with the three ball. Yeah, they were prolific because they had guys that could shoot the ball. They had. Clay Thompson, one of the best shooters in the game. They has, and they got Steph Curry, one of the best shooters in the game. Kevin Durant, yeah, he can stroke. 
Okay, but Kevin was doing you at the mid post isolation, and he'll take you down the block. And Draymond was is, is to pick your part, is to pick your part guy with the pass. Yeah, he'll throw it up there, but he's not shooting in a high clip, a high percentage. The high percentage shooters are shooting the majority of the shots. <laughs> so you know it's. Um, but once playoffs start and they start keying on things, you got to be able to play off the dribble and you got to be able to make the mid-range shot. What did Jimmy Butler say a couple years, a few years back when he, when he made his first all-star appearance? What did he do the entire summer? He worked on his mid-range game. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's what it – no one – if you can get down there and you can, you, you can draw people to come, if you can draw more than one defender – I mean, I, I still believe that's a very good, very good place to work. But it does interfere with the so-called, as my little boy would do, the quote, quotation mark spacing. You know, it does interfere with the spacing of the game. But, you know, that's an area in which you got to be able to make a high percentage of shots in playoffs when, when games start going you versus me in multiple, in multiple games. And that's when it really gets down to just uh, taking what the defense gives you, right? Right, that, right. That's what the playoffs it ends up just being. Yeah, that's what it is now. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's what's going to – it's going to be so much – it'll be a lot of fun to see younger players or younger players uh, get into when, when you know, unfortunately, you know, right now we, we can't – we can only think about what ifs, but – to see younger players that's getting on the stage for the first time and you know that they can do one thing really well, what happens when someone starts to key on that? Mm -hmm. can, you, can you do something else to help me win? So I look forward to seeing that. Whenever we play again, of course, which is what we look yeah. forward to seeing. Right. We'll, get to, right. we'll get to more with Keith uh, in a second after a word from one of our sponsors. All right. We'll get back to our episode with Keith Askins here in a second, but want to tell you about a great new sponsor of the Five Reasons Sports Network. We're really excited about this, and apparently a lot of you are too, because when I started to announce this on Twitter, everybody's like, oh, I love that place. And it's Mr. M's Sandwich Shop. That's right. You can find them in Hollywood, but also in Davie, and that's right across from Nova Southeastern University, where the Dolphins train and have trained for years on University Drive. That's how I know the place, because when I was covering the Dolphins, I would always stop in there. And we've got a great deal for you. If you go to MrMsSubs.com, that's M-R-M-S-Subs.com, enter the discount code 5R for five reasons, and you'll get 15 percent off. They've been serving South Florida there since 1979 with Philly cheesesteak, subs, wraps, and salads, and everything there is made to order. When you go inside, say hello to Paul and Jody. Tell them you heard them on the Five on the Floor podcast on Five Reasons Sports. You'll get special treatment, but the food's great anyway. So go to Mr. M Sandwich Shop, and again, online order. Obviously, everybody's stuck inside right now, right? So Mr. M S Subs.com discount code 5R and you'll get 15% off. And now back to today's episode. All right, back here with Keith. All right, so let's get to the transition. You mentioned Ronnie Rothstein. You had Kevin Lockery as a coach. You had Alvin Gentry as a coach. Um, and then in the middle of the 90s, you're talking about the brand of basketball that was being played. And, you know, at that point you had a team with, you know, Anthony Mason playing the three in New York and, mm -hmm. you know, in the finals with – Pat Riley and, and obviously that kind of team. And then Pat comes down here to Miami. Uh, what was your first con first thing? Did you think that you would be able to stick around for the Riley era? And what was your, your conversations like with Pat when he came down here as coach? Well, you know, the only thing I said for him is that, um, you know, I'll be ready to play for you. You know, when, when the time comes, I'll be ready. You don't have to worry about me. I'll be ready. When you call my name, I'll be ready. And, um, you know, the biggest emphasis that, you know, when we were here waiting, expecting him, the only thing we, we knew is that he had a stickler. He's a stickler for condition. I mean, you had to be, there's a certain requirement of conditioning level that you, you got to achieve and maintain. And so that's the last thing I wanted to have happen to me, not be ready physically to play for him. Uh, mentally, I could take anything any man throws at me, but physically I wanted to be able to, to endure whatever he had 
you know, his mind set on doing with this. So, uh, but I tell you, it was the first, the first time I did the conditioning test. I, I think, I don't think anyone slept the night before because we had never done anything like that. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was something where you'd be like, you know, it was, it was heavy mentally and physically it was tough. But once you got through it, you, you felt like you could do anything. What was it, Keith? I mean, tell us. Because we've, uh, we've had guys try to start tell some of these stories about, yeah. about why they didn't want to come to Miami or why they, they don't know how they survived in Miami. Well, well, at the time, we used to do what was called WIST, and that's the going to run in the court side, sideline to sideline. And you have to do it 17 times uh, within a certain time period. And so you had five sets of those. And let it be known, the time frame was less than a minute. So you have to do that. And there'll be three guys. Usually it was three guys in line. So that means you're getting two minutes rest uh, before your next opportunity comes. You got lucky you had four guys in your line. And you're like, oh, my God, I got an extra minute of rest. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, and the good thing about it is that you could bank time. So if, say, your, your time to make was a minute, you did it in – uh, 50 seconds, you bank 10 seconds. So now you may be able to run the next one in a minute 10 and so on and so on. And, but man, those things, man. And it's not like it is today. Now today they actually do the, the conditioning tests uh, before training camp opens. This conditioning test was the first part of training camp. That was the first thing you did in training camp. And then after that, you went right into a two, two, three hour practice. So, yeah, you talking about being mentally tough. <laughs> <laughs> that, that separates, that separates guys, you know, on an instant from you'll know who's, who's going to be able to battle with you and who's not. Just from that first day that we used to have in training camp. Well, 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 he brought in a few more guys to battle with you. Um, the, the, yeah. acqui the, 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 the acquisition of Zoe, uh, the acquisition in the middle of the season of Tim, the acquisition mm -hmm. of MASH. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you start to feel like, okay, we have – because you were on some teams that had some promise before Pat right. came, but it was never right. really fulfilled. You got to the first right. round of the playoffs, lost to Atlanta, lost to Chicago. But when did you start to feel like, okay, we can do something real here? Was it the day that Zoe was acquired uh, or when did it sort of happen? Well, you know, you know, Zoe, you know, we had a, we had a, uh, a team when, you know, you talk about Zoe, Zoe brought something that, you know, we didn't have. Zoe brought star power to uh to the franchise you know and that's that's no that's not saying you know that's not being you know you know talking down on Ronnie and Glenn and everyone like that but Zoe Zoe had something Zoe had that persona he had uh, he had the stats behind him and you know he was an anchor he was a legit anchor and because he would he would anchor you on defense and you could throw it to him down on the block and he would anchor you there. So he was doing it on both ends of the court. And, but when Tim came in big, we call him bigs because he could hit no one, no one hit bigger shots and, and wanted the ball in moments and big moments more than him. So, um, you know, when Timmy got there and you had it, he and Zoe together, that's a, that was a, a legit, uh, all star one two punch, and then you add Mash, who could do it. You know, Mash was was a tremendous offensive player that could, you know, at his size, probably one of the, if he was playing today, he would probably be considered like, uh, I guess you call him a stretch four or point yeah. forward. He had point forward skills. Um, and the one that the, the sleeper and the silent one, and he is the quiet one, is P.J. Brown. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think about P.J. and now that gave us seven foot seven, you know, well, P.J. was actually taller than Zoe. Uh, but they gave us a, a pretty formidable back, you know, a back line right there. When you talk, you talk about those two guys anchoring your defense and then you add Dan Marley on the wing and myself, I mean, we – we were we were 
physically tough. And I, and the thing about that group, it, it was, it was a mentally tough group as well. I mean, all hardcore and physical players didn't mind contact. And I can't leave out for Sean Leonard, who was, you know, probably one of the better spot shooters <laughs> in that in that time that's never talked about. I mean, Bo could just flat out – if Bo got hot, man, he, he, you would think he was never going to miss. So let's go through some quick stories on this. And, and Alex, I'm, I'm going to bring some of these back for you. Because, Alex, what year were you born again? Tell, tell Keith. 96. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> right, right at the dawn of this. Now, 96, right. I was sitting courtside at MSG. Uh, mm -hmm. for the beginning of those Heat Knicks series. So uh, mm -hmm. we're going to get right to it because you mentioned it. I thought that team was perfectly constructed. I thought the only team that could keep them, uh, you guys, from getting to a finals would be the Bulls, provided mm -hmm. Jordan was there. Right. But, it, but it didn't happen, and it mostly didn't happen because of the Knicks. So I'm going to bring right. up some, some memories, some, some good, some not so good. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you take me through them. Uh, what do you remember of the, of the P.J. Charlie Ward uh, fracas uh, that that occurred at the Garden and and how that kind of changed that series. Well, well, see, Charlie, did Charlie, Charlie did something that you know you very seldom see anyone trying to do in the NBA. You you very rarely see the, the top guy on the free throw line going down, chopping down on the on on the big. They usually go and they get the shooter, or they or they come to the middle. Uh, but he went and chopped down on PJ's knees. And obviously, for him, for PJ to react like that, he did it. You know, it was something that was happening, that had happened more than once. And I think PJ just got tired of it, just flipped him around. <laughs> it was, is that the one where uh, Jeff was holding on to those? No, that's that? a different one. I was going to okay. ask you about that one, too. They all, they, they all kind of run together. Yeah. That's, the, that's the one that every – well, the weirdest thing about that one, too, you mentioned PJ. PJ is one of my – if I have an all-time right. favorite list of five guys that I've covered with the Heat, yeah. PJ's on it. Right, and he—I mean—he took losing hard, but he was one of the nicest guys you've ever, right. ever you'd ever deal with. It was just the weirdest thing that PJ Brown, of all people, became right. a villain. <laughs> right? yeah. No, no, no. It, that's why I said. That's the reason why I said if Charlie. Something, some, something had to happen prior to this, to where PJ got fed up. And I mean, one thing you don't do, and you know, for all the young players out there listening. Don't go down. Don't mess with a big man's knees. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. if that's 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 wrong. That's that's like a chop block in the NFL. You don't you don't mess around with with big guys' lower legs like that because that's that's career threatening. Um, and you know, PJ went into survival mode. I mean, he he flipped Charlie. I mean, it was. It, it was actually a pretty good move. I mean, he took Charlie's momentum and, and, and just turned him into a little, into a top almost. Uh, <laughs> and, and then there were all the suspensions. You guys actually, that was the right. series you won. Um, yeah. Now the, now the three, the three that you guys lost um, for different reasons. Uh, and, and there, there were, again, th this to me, again, the craziest sequence of series I've ever seen because you've never seen two rivals go at it four straight years mm -hmm. and every game be decided on the final game, either oh, game yeah, seven right. or the game five. I don't think we'll ever see that again, mm -hmm. to be honest. And particularly all the other history that was going on um, there, the Allen Houston shot. Right. Uh, right. That basically take, take me through your emotions of, of that situation. Well, it was it was a situation in which you know as a player you're sitting there and you know you want to everybody has a moment in which you think hey man this is when I know this is this is where I need to be you know I actually thought I would I would be be in the game at the time but I wasn't and you know to see him come off see him get an open look at the top and I'm almost I can see it at the top of the key I think right in that area came off uh I think he came off a slice from up underneath the basket, straight line cut, got it. I don't I think someone forgot to stunt. May have been Tim, didn't stunt. And uh the ball bounces, bounces. And at that moment, yeah, it's like they say, hey, it could go it's it could go in or it could go out or it could come out. It went in and that was the game. I mean 
one defensive possession. All you needed was a defensive possession. And, and most people say, you know, well, games are lost way before that possession. And sure, sure, games are lost within the flow of the game where you can have one or two plays to make a that, that gives you an opportunity to win. But at that moment, it was one play that needed to be made to win, and we didn't make it. How did you guys deal with that? And I'm going to get to another one in a second because I have a, there's a great debate that you need to help settle here. Mm-hmm. But how did you guys deal with the frustrations of getting so close against that team? Because you didn't like that team either. I mean, this right. isn't like the current day. You, you, well, you, you know, I don't, think, I don't think any team liked us. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's, you know, they talk about, you know, the bad boys and their, their reputation. When we walked out onto the court, they, you know, teams knew what they were coming, that what they were going to get into. I mean, it was, you know, we, we took pride in not bending over and grabbing our knees and, you know, fourth quarter come, we wanted to be, you know, that's when the conditioning level kicks in. And, and usually if, if you're highly, you well-trained and conditioned and your mind is alert, you tend to come out and you, and you win games. And, you know, for us to, to lose close ones like that, uh, it was frustrating, but you know, it wasn't that we we're going, you know, it was like, okay, we got to keep doing again. It's like, you don't learn to, you don't win until you learn, until you lose. So we were figuring eventually we we're going to win. Now you were not uh, a player, right? In the 99, 2000 season. No, okay. No. And so, but, but this is one of the great debates we've had it on this uh, podcast with several other people. I have always defended you. I've always been a mash defender. Uh-huh. So I, I've always defended mash's decision. Right. The last play of the game to mm-hmm. pass to Clarence Weatherspoon when it appeared that mash had an open look at the right. end of that game. Right. Where do you well, come down on the greatest heat to be d- d- debate of the century? <laughs> you know, I, you know, my thing, you know, mash, he's open was Clarence open for a better shot. That's that's the question. You know, I can't put myself in the matches in the matches thinking on, on that situation. Yeah, he could have taken the shot, but let's put it this way. He takes the shot, he misses, and Clarence was wide open. The debate would be like, God, he should have passed it to Clarence. He was even close and he was wide open. He probably would have made that shot. You know? So, mm-hmm. you know, it's you know, you can't you know, if if the man, if a player makes a pass to to someone to one of his teammates that's open, well, you you can't fault him for that. Yeah, do you want Mash, who's your at that time Mash is you know probably considered the third option on the team? If if you're going into like the talk of the threes, the big threes, I think Mash would be Tim, Zoe, and Mash would be the focal points of our offense and. You get someone that's a focal point of your offense a shot, and yeah, you want him to take it. But if he if he feels that someone's open with a better look, you gotta you gotta live with it. I mean, Clarence, everyone on that court at that time was capable of making a play, and we didn't do it. Well, good because you agree with me. All right, so we'll get we'll get to more we'll get to more of this uh, after the break with Keith Askins. Okay. We'll get back to our episode in a second, but I want to tell you about another of the great sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network. They're kind of in the same business as us, although they do things a little bit differently, and that's the Lessons Via Leaders podcast. It's a weekly podcast show where they interview a new entrepreneur, founder, or thought leader every single week. Many of the guests on Lessons Via Leaders are local leaders here in South Florida that built huge businesses and fostered large communities and movements. Each show features a new guest that shares with the audience valuable lessons and learnings that they've amassed over the course of their careers. Their shows can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else pretty much that you can find this podcast. They also have a video version of each episode that they post on YouTube. So make sure you check it out. YouTube, Instagram is Lessons Via Leaders, and the Twitter account is Lessons Via the leaders. We're going to have uh, some of their hosts here on our show with us soon. They are, of course, South Florida sports fans. So check out Lessons Via Leaders, the podcast. And now back to today's episode. All right, back here with Keith Askins. We're going to close here with some rapid fire. So uh, Alex and I have some questions for you uh, and we'll get to them here here quickly for you. Uh, First one for you. Best Pat Riley speech that you ever heard? 
Man, best pet rallies. Dude, I can't I can't say one is better than the other because uh, you know, I've sat in meetings and dinners and you know, I I took it every day as kind of like being in class. So it it was like it was almost like a like I was having lectures every day. I mean, I I I enjoyed the first part of practice. Most guys didn't do it because it was kind of like a boardroom meeting where he would come in, you'll sit down, he'll brief you on he'll brief you on yesterday, he'll brief you on today and what we're gonna do to get better. And um, it was fun for me. I mean, I've seen him <laughs> I've I I can't tell you one that's that's better than the other, but I do know that he has he had the power when I was a player and even now that you know I believe I believe it's worth. I mean he is one of the most loyal men that I've ever met and uh you know I can remember the day you know before I was gonna be released we're over at LaSalle you know he calls me to the office and said Keith um you know, I, I, I may have to release you, you know, I'm like, it's the first time I'm like, well, you know, you got to do what you got to do coach. You know, I was getting, I was banged up. Um, and you know, it's just like, you know, it's just, we go down to practice. It's like, but I don't want you to do anything. I don't want you to, to mess up, or do anything that's going, 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 uh, if you don't want to practice a day, you don't have to, or something like that. And I'm like, man, I'm here to do my job. I'm, I'm do my job until it's, uh, until it's done. And I did, man, when I would practice and, you know, late on that day, he weighed me and, you know, one thing he told me, he said, Keith, you know, you'll, you'll always have a, you always got a spot with me. And I said, well, I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, and he's a man of his word. You know, I've been, I've been with the organization now for what, 30 years, going on 31 years. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll run through a wall for him. If, if, if he told, if he was to tell me there's a crack in this wall, if you hit it properly, you know, you can probably go right through it. Yeah. And, and if someone said, try it, I wouldn't have any problem trying it because I believe it. <laughs> yeah. And my brainwashed maybe, you know, but I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you were speaking about Alonzo earlier and I thought it was really interesting because I think, one can say that maybe Bam is, Bam is the modern day version of Alonzo to for what the C team is now, where whereas Alonzo was just uh, much better as a rim protector mm -hmm. and as a you know as a standard big man with a standard big man skill set for right. the most part. Bam right. has a, a more modern game for up tempo, can do uh -huh. the stuff, uh -huh. uh, and is also a defensive anchor. Was an elite defender this year, right? First year as a starter. Uh, how do you what do you think about that comparison? Well. Um, you know, if you say both, both are anchoring, both are anchors in their own way, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's like, Zoe, it's like apple and oranges, really. Zoe did all his work, you know, from 15 feet in and, you know, the goal with, uh, well, hell, I guess, I guess Bam is doing the same thing, but Bam, Bam initiates the offense more. Yeah. You know, the progression that that's going to be good to see with Bam is that, you know, there's, when he begins to really look at the rim every time <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and shoot the ball from, mm -hmm. from 15 to 17 feet without, hes without hesitation, it's going to be it's going to be mind blowing to where his game is going to go. I mean, that's if you think about it, the only thing he has and he doesn't have to, you know, putting him out knocking down threes, that's fine and dandy. But to see him progress and and play the way he plays now, you know, he just keeps adding to his game and that's what good players do every year they come back with something new and he did it. I mean, it's I mean, it's gonna be fun to watch. I I'm enjoying it, and you know, it's it's it's, it's fun. Again, you sound like us. Uh, all right, let's get let's get to one more memory for you, and then Alex has one. Uh, I gotta ask you about Ron Artest. Okay. Because you, you, cause you mentioned that you ran, now met a world peace, but that that you would run through a wall for Pat, and mm -hmm. I think that's one of those incidents where Artest, who was a player actually that Pat always kind of coveted, right, uh, and, and wanted here. 
but uh, but he went it he went at Pat one time. Can you take us right. through that incident? Oh yeah. Well, you know, the short of it is that you know, one thing you know you don't do you don't you don't you respect the other team's coach, and and you you try not to have any conversations with anyone on on their bench. I mean, that's the way I was brought up, and that's the way I learned to play. And you know, he kind of got he, he was he was wrong, and he actually said something. And I think it was directed at me. And I simply told him, um, you don't know me. So, you know, I, I have no problems, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's basically what I said. You don't know me, man. And I have no problems. <laughs> <laughs> and how did he respond to that? <laughs> uh, you know, hey, it, you know, it's, it's always, you know, talk and whatnot. But, you know, that's, that's one thing that, I I don't and and I never dreamt that I would be here raising twin boys that 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 are like basketball junkies and mm -hmm. and eventually going to be <laughs> you know encyclopedias and and novice of the game. I mean all they do is research, man, and and they're coming up with stuff. And so now my 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 image when I was one of these slim wiry tough guys going to come back to <laughs> I'm starting to get questions like why. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully they'll hopefully they'll understand that you know it was all in competition. I don't. I'm not out to hurt anyone. I wasn't out to hurt anyone, but I'm I'm going to protect myself as well as people that I work with, and that's that's all that was about. It, nothing nothing came of it. You know I don't even know if Ron would even know anything if he would even think about that today. Like whatever you know. <laughs> Keith, uh, I wanted to ask you because part of the repercussions now with the last dance being out there, and you know, it's kind of the biggest thing going on right now on TV and pop culture. Uh, one of the things that's being talked about constantly now is the LeBron and jo versus Jordan conversation. And you obviously, like we talked about earlier, went up against Jordan. You uh, were on the coaching staff when LeBron was here, and You've been here for a long time now. You've been part of the game for a long time now. What do, what do you think are the biggest differences between them? And maybe you don't got to pick one over the other, but if they were playing in the same league today, who would you pick? They wouldn't guard each other, first of all. True. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Both trying to stay out of foul trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they, they wouldn't guard each other. They would probably guard each other in the fourth quarter if needed. Yeah, last two minutes. Or, or the team would have someone – or that both teams would have someone. They would have one defender on their squad to, to do, the, do that job for them. Um, you know, it's, it's totally two different, two different eras and two types of players. Um, you know, Michael was by far the best in his era and LeBron arguably is the best in his era. Um, both, uh, both you can build a team with and you'll, and you'll, you'll play for multiple championships. Um, you know, Michael was not as, and everyone's seen he wasn't, more he wasn't into the into the social into social aspects and and to his credit i mean the the mobile phone was just coming about the internet was just coming about so there wasn't as many outlets to be to be heard and speak on on you know other issues other than basketball so you know there, there are differences. Both, both are great people, man. I mean, both are great people, great, great basketball players, and 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 both will be remembered. You know, as you know, as probably arguably the best in their era. You know, I don't think it's fair to to compare players like that and not talk about you know Oscar Robertson, uh, mm -hmm. Earl of Pearl Monroe, Wilt Chamberlain, you Kareem, know, Kareem. Uh, I mean, there's the list could go on. There's a lot of guys out there that are deserving to be in that in that conversation. And what happens is just that these two are, you know, are are the latest to be in that yeah. conversation. You know, 
<laughs> so I, I I can't even – I can't pick. I just put them both as 1A and 1B. And if given any given day, it depends on who you like. You can make him A and you can make him B, but they're both ones. Fair. Uh, one more question about LeBron. Do you agree mm -hmm. with us that he was at his best when he was here in Miami? We, we felt that he was here – and he was a, you know, a top five type elite defensive player. He was doing all the point guard stuff, was at his best offensively from, you know, as a finisher and as a three-point shooter at that time, was still in his athletic prime and won the most championships here in the least time. Well, that's... I agree that he was here, he was at his best when he was here. We had him right in that age grouping, you know. We had him, how old was he when he was here? I mean, 25, that's 26, 25, right? 25, 26. Hey, 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 25, 26, you don't even have to do a lot of stretching. You just go out there and play at that age, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, of course, we had him in some very good years. But, you know, give the man credit. I mean, all he does is win, and he, can, and he wins, and he, he, he puts himself in a position to play for a championship every year. Uh, I would probably say we heck, we got him when he was at his best because we won two with him. We went two out of four. That's 50% compared to what he went to up in Cleveland. So, um, you know, hey, we, we had a good run with him. I, you know, as I tell people, you know, I've seen people, I've, I've been on planes, I've been in restaurants, I've been at bars, and especially during basketball season. Yeah. Oh, I can't, I can't stand LeBron. I'm not going to lie. And I, and I have to say, cause I can't just sit there and listen to that. <laughs> I, 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 I asked them, I'm like, what do you not like about LeBron? Oh, well, I, I hear, I said, do you, I say, I said, do you know him? <laughs> I said, like, no, no, but I hear, I said, what, what, what do you hear? I said, do you hear about him? Like opening up a school, and, and sending kids to school into a good environment of school for free. Do you hear about him, you know, donating bicycles? Do you hear about him sending kids to college every year? I said, I said do you hear about him gifting all his teammates with, 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 with apparel and, and accessories from his, from his endorsements? They're like, no. I said, so what do you hear about him? Well, I hear that he's, what? He's a very good basketball player because you can't, you can't, you can't knock him for his numbers. Well, well, I guess you're right. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. I said, like, well, I, then I say, look, I don't. I said, no, I'm not just saying this. You know, I said, I, and I and I never tell him, you know, that I know the man and that I've I've worked with him. I just and I just tell him, hey, look, don't judge him, just don't hearsay. I mean, you got to be able, if you're going to say that, I, I can't stand, I hate. If you use a word like I hate, mm -hmm. you have to have a personal experience to hate someone. That's a word that shouldn't even be used. <laughs> no, no doubt. And, and I think everybody who had personal interactions with LeBron uh, during his four years right. has a very different perception of this yeah. than, than, than people yeah. on the outside. Yeah. I, 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 I think all of us, I mean, you worked with him individually. I worked right. with him in a different capacity in, right. a, in a reporter athlete relationship, but uh, I can speak to many, many kind things he did related yeah. to me that, that, yeah. uh, that I don't think get put across. I mean, Ethan, you think about it, you know, this, these, these players today, because of the, uh, the, the, the social, the outs, the outlets in which you could interact with people today. Mm -hmm. I mean, for for a man that has never ever done anything that you can really say it's bad. I mean, I mean, I mean, he's squeaky clean. And you're talking about a kid that's coming that came straight from high school to pros and could have easily been persuaded to get into this, to get into that, and been a knucklehead about it. Give credit to his mother, man. I mean, his mother put him around a good group of guys that that showed him how to be a professional and 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 become who he is today. I mean, everyone talks about his his grouping of guys that he have around from that he grew up with. Give him credit for putting these guys and in positions to better themselves and and to become successful on their own and not and not really taken from him but adding mm -hmm. i mean this i mean this is tremendous it's, it's, it's tremendous it's a tremendous story 
I mean, it's, it's going to be one that'll be written about. I mean, this kid from, if you talk about rags to riches, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Let me give you a, a, a few perimeter defenders in, in heat history because it's a pretty long list, okay? And mm-hmm. then I'm going to ask you a question related to them. Mm-hmm. Yourself, Bruce Bowen, Dan Marley, James Posey, Jimmy Butler, uh, just, to, just to start with that group. I know I'm missing some here, but those, uh, those, are, those are the, some of the ones that uh, – that come the three and D types as we talk about. Right. You know, mostly the D types. Right. You got to get one stop. You got to get one stop. We yeah, go with Keith Haskins. Uh, we you, go. Know going, you know I'm going with myself, but <laughs> yeah, but Bruce Bruce was a Bruce was a great understudy man. I uh, I enjoyed I enjoyed I enjoyed Bruce. Bruce is a Bruce is a good person. Uh, pesty, you know the thing that you learn and we all we all do is that when you play against you know when you when you consider yourself be good defensively. If you're not on the first option, uh, you you feel like you're being wasted, you know. And, and these guys, in which you call out, everybody guards the number one guy most of, most nights, night in, night out. You are going against the number one guy. So, with saying that, you know that, that's a that's a heavy workload. And and so the corner the corner jumper for myself and Bruce was was our was our way. To to I guess keep a defense on is if if you left a weak side corner open, it, it was possible that shot could go in if it got around there. Um, and when you think about all these guys, I think the attention to detail and the preparation of who you're playing, you gotta all all studied. You know you can't you can't guard people if you don't know what they're going to do. Um, and all good guys. I mean, every guy you called out is, is still involved in basketball in some way. You know, you mentioned Jimmy, the latter when he's still playing. But, you know, Dan, Dan has been an, a, an assistant and professional. He's, he just, you know, he was relieved of his duties as head coach at Grand Canyon, which he had for years. And I'm pretty sure if he wants to coach again, he can do it. Um, Posey is, is it now an assistant coach in the league. Uh, Bruce has been – you know, involved with commentary since he's gotten out of the game. And myself, uh, you know, fortunate to to still be with the Heat for 30 years now, you know, 1990 to now. Um, man, that's, that's a role. That's a hell of a ride that I'm on. I don't want to get off of it. Final one. Who is, I, we mentioned earlier, Alex mentioned you were kind of the original undrafted OG mm-hmm. for the Heat. Mm-hmm. But who is the true undrafted OG for the Heat? Is it you uh, or UD? Well, I'm a go. I'm a, you know I'm I'm a yesteryear. I'm I mean, when you look at what Udonis has done, I you know I made it. I was you know I was more of a role player. You know, relief relief man. Udonis as an undrafted rookie to come in and start for you uh, in most of his career and anchor. Uh, a championship defense in 06, um, you know, that's special. You know, I mean, I can remember the first, you know, I, I had the honor of driving the, the rookie van with Udonis, and I had Udonis, Dwayne, second-year guys, Rasul Butler, may rest in peace, and Karan Butler. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had those four guys in the van headed to summer league, and I remember when Udonis asked me. He said, "I said, I, I told you, Udonis. I said, you, if you want to make not just the Miami Heat, if you want to make any team in the NBA, if you show that you can defend and rebound, you can play for any team in the league." You know, forget about offense. If you can show you can defend and rebound, there's a spot for you. And and the rest is history. Yeah. I remember Dwayne was Dwayne was complaining. Dwayne was talking how he couldn't get a shoe contract. No one would give him a shoe contract. I, I said, <laughs> I, Ethan, no joke. No one would give him a shoe contract. Nike wouldn't give him. So he ended up going to Converse. And I, I told him, I said, young brother, I said, Get the shoes that's going to that's gonna be good for your feet, that's going to allow you to perform at a high level. 
if it goes the way I think and you play the way you're capable, you will not have a problem getting a shoe deal. I guarantee you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, and it's those little conversations with young guys when they're their first time coming through, and and then later on you see them, you're like, God, look what look what you become, man. It's 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 a great feeling, and you know you you like to think that even if it was just a little thing you told them or a little card you gave them, you know, before a game, that it it stuck with them and and it actually helped them somewhere down the line. You're not trying to take credit for anything that they've accomplished. You just want to say that, you know, hey, just maybe something that I told and helped them out along the way. Yeah. Well, we appreciate that. We appreciate your 30 years with the Miami Heat. Keith, thank you for doing this. Um, stay safe. And, you too, uh, man. And, and we got to get more of your guys on. So if you ever if you ever still talk to, uh, you know, we've been trying to get Glenn here for a while. So uh, he, oh, yeah? he's, he's been promising. He's been requested. But, uh, but we really appreciate you taking the time. Well, you know who to call. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always have. That's <laughs> All right. All right, man. Thanks, Keith. All right, bro. Be good. Thank you for listening to The Five on the Floor on the Five Regional Sports Network.